Hello, everyone. Um, there are a few people still joining. Um, thank you all for joining us today for this um, important and timely discussion focusing on uh, Palestinian youth mobilization in the Sheikh Jarrah era and assessing the, this new wave um, in Palestinian politics. My name is Tamara Haroub. I'm the Assistant uh, Executive Director and Senior Research Fellow at Arab Center Washington, DC. I am pleased to welcome all of you to today's webinar featuring um, a lineup of impressive um, analysts and activists. Um, unfortunately, Salim Barahna was not able to join us. Uh, he is not feeling well today. Uh, he is the executive director of the Palestine Institute for Public Diplomacy. Um, but we have three other excellent speakers that um, I look forward to hearing from. Um, we do apologize for this uh, last minute change, but um, um, we hope Stalin feels better. And um, I've expanded my remarks a little bit. Um, if, just a heads up in case you think this is um, a little too long. Um, so following the events um, in the last few weeks in Palestine, we at the Arab Center of Washington, DC, um, sought to organize this, this webinar to discuss the emergence of um, a new um, and the future implications of this newly energized and unified activism by Palestinian youth, uh, both in historic Palestine and throughout the, the diaspora. As most of you know, um, the recent wave of protests and violence started when a group of young people in Sheikh Jarrah held um, nightly protests against the Israeli dis displacement and ethnic cleansing of eight families from the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood in Jerusalem. These protests were in the form of sit-ins. Uh, the young people uh, came together to break the Ramadan fast. Uh, they sat together and they sang. Um, this comes after a month earlier, um, popular protests by young people outside Damascus Gate in Jerusalem pushed um, Israel to remove the divider fences that they placed to prevent Palestinians, especially young people, from sitting on the stairs there. So these acts of, of just sitting by young people in Sheikh Jarrah and outside Damascus Gate um, were met with violent attacks and arrests by the Israeli army and police and by harassments uh, from the settlers. Um, against this backdrop, uh, what followed is uh, the Israeli poli police entered the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound, assaulted um, worshippers during the holiest night of Ramadan, which triggered um, further outrage and anger throughout the occupied territories and in, uh, for Palestinians inside Israel. Uh, Hamas launched rockets uh, from the besieged Gaza Strip, and Israel uh, started an 11-day intense bombardment and destruction of Gaza that killed um, more than 250 Palestinians, including 65 uh, children, and forcibly displaced 72,000 people in, in the Gaza Strip, uh, many of whom for the second, third, or even fourth time. Um, 12 Israelis were killed by uh, Hamas rockets. Also, um, in cities across Israel, violence soared and Palestinian citizens uh, were targeted by lynch mobs organized by um, extremists and Israeli settlers. They organized these, these attacks on WhatsApp and Telegram and um, even shared names and times and locations of the Palestinians to attack. Um, the Israeli police uh, made 75 arrests and 170 charges, the majority of whom were disproportionately of Palestinians. As this series of events was unfolding, the Palestinian Authority was largely absent from the scene, uh, doing little beyond um, issuing statements of condemnation, which is um, the usual. And in, in this context, the Palestinian youth filled this vacuum. Um, the absence of Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian Authority's intervention in Jerusalem in particular, and maybe the absence of the outdated strategies of um, the Palestinian political parties may have presented an opportunity here for grassroots mobilizations um, in the city. What is remarkable about um, this wave of mobilization is per perhaps the return to um, decentralized grassroots organizing after more than two decades of authoritarian measures uh, in cooperation with the Israeli occupation forces um, by the uh, Palestinian Authority uh, after the Oslo Accords. 
Uh, this resulted in the mar marginalization, the huge marginalization of civil society organization, and especially young people who have become disillusioned with the Palestinian leadership, and maybe even more so after um, President Mahmoud Abbas canceled um, the elections. So Palestinians from across the occupied territories, Israel and the diaspora communities um, around the world, especially young people, mobilized and rallied together, uh, holding strikes, protests, marches, um, sharing their experiences and histories on social media, and even some driving for hours to Jerusalem to support um, the people of Sheikh Jarrah. Young Palestinians, especially from uh, Sheikh Jarrah, who grew up under the threat of, of displacement, took leadership um, and mobilized using social media tools, providing around the clock reporting, organizing protests um, on these tools, and broadcasting online uh, on TikTok and other media platforms across the world. The world. Um, these were largely leaderless and without political affiliation. Uh, these young people were able to connect and reunite the fragmented Palestinian communities in Gaza, the West Bank, Israel, and the Palestinian diaspora. Um, dubbed uh, the TikTok generation, uh, these Palestinian young people used social media like TikTok, Instagram, WhatsApp, and other apps to bypass um, mainstream media gatekeeping, uh, Palestinian authority, um, measures uh, to silence them and the violent Israeli fragmentation of the Palestinian populations. Uh, this energized Palestinian resistance took many forms. Uh, we saw young Palestinians posing and smiling as they were being arrested, uh, while others held concerts near Israeli checkpoints and at different uh, places throughout the West Bank, um, Jerusalem and, Israel, and Gaza as well. Um, there is no doubt that social media played an important role in helping young Palestinians report on the events and disseminate live videos, pictures, and memes to beat the censorship of tech companies um, that um, have been well documented to work in cooperation with the repressive um, Israel cyber security, security unit, um, cyber unit that um, works with, with the Israeli government. Some even consider um, the easily digestible video clips and live streams on TikTok to be game changers. And, um, you know, long, young Palestinians everywhere mobilized in unity and simultaneously to a degree that we have not seen um, in decades. So organizing, joining protests, strikes, boycotts, civil action, demanding the basic rights and freedoms of the Palestinian people and framing their challenges as a one as one shared um, struggle. And this is beyond the failed framework of the two state solution and uh, in defiance to the failed Palestinian leadership and, and the toothless international community. And now as the ceasefire went into effect um, on May 21st and the world went back to ignoring um, the ongoing Israeli occupation and apartheid policies, where is this um, energized youth mobilization heading? Does this momentum reflect um, a changing Palestinian political consensus and a new Palestinian strategy? Is this a transformative moment in the struggle for Palestinian rights and um, for the freedom um, of Palestinian people and the Palestinian national movement as well? Can a new young leadership uh, in Palestine emerge outside the traditional political parties. And looking at the international community, are the shifts in narratives and public attitudes along with the growing youth solidarity significant? Are we beginning, beginning to see a crack in foreign policies towards Palestine and Israel and vis-a-vis -vis the two-state solution? Especially um, now seeing the presence of progressive um, representatives in US Congress and maybe a slight change in language by the Biden administration, which came after a long silence uh, on the recent events. And finally, uh, what are the prospects for uh, real change to effectively address um, Israel's ongoing occupation and discriminatory policies? 
to answer these questions, we are very fortunate to have um, three excellent analysts who have taken the time to be with us today and share their insights. I will uh, briefly introduce them in alphabetical order. Uh, Maryam Barghouti is a Palestinian American writer and researcher. Uh, Diana Butto is a lawyer, a human rights lawyer and analyst. And she's a former legal advisor to the PLO and the Palestinian negotiations. Amjad Iraqi is the editor and writer at um, 972 magazine, or plus 972 magazine. Um, thanks to all of you for joining us, and I look forward to your contributions. Um, again, uh, just a reminder for those of you who saw the, the lineup of speakers, Salim Barahme is unfortunately not feeling well and was not able to join us. Uh, before we start the discussion, allow me to just um, remind everyone about the questions. Uh, you can send in your questions anytime during the, the discussion. Um, you can use the Q&A feature on Zoom to send in your questions, or if you are watching on our website, um, please send your questions by email to events at arabcenterdc.org. That is again, events at arabcenterdc.org. Um, please identify yourself and your affiliation if possible and indicate to whom your question is addressed. We will try to take as many questions as possible. Uh, the format for today will be uh, two rounds of questions for the panelists, um, which will take up the first hour. Then we'll spend the first 30 minutes um, taking your questions and an answering questions from um, the online audience. Um, and with that, let's, uh, without further ado, let's start the discussion. Um, round one will focus on the assessment of the recent wave of unified Palestinian youth activism. And I would like to start with um, Diana. Uh, Diana, in your assessment, um, what is the state of Palestinian youth and activism today? And what factors led to this energized and unified mobilization in 2021 in particular? Um, is this different? How is this different than um, what we've seen before? Um, and maybe just to build on that, what is your assessment of the current state of the Palestinian leadership vis-a-vis um, -vis this youth, youth uh, movement? Um, is this a new era in Palestinian politics or, or just uh, a phase? Diana? Uh, thank you very much, Tamara. Thanks for including me in this wonderful panel. I also want to thank my co-panelists, Amjad and Mariam, for being so outstanding and uh, really carrying the flag during this period. It's been, it's been so heartening to see all of us um, working together as we always have. And I'm very proud to be able to share a stage um, with them today. Uh, Tamara, in order to answer your question, it's, I think we have to step back a little bit. I think there always has been youth engagement and mobilization um, throughout history in Palestine. And I think that this mobilization is not just in one area, but it has crossed all of these fictitious lines that Israel has created for us. Because as we know, Israeli racism and discrimination and apartheid don't stop at the green line. They obviously spill over into, into all of the different parts of Palestine. I think what made this different, however, if we can say that it is different, is that it, it ended up spreading a little bit more. So in the past, and I can just give you some examples, in the past in 2018, when Israel, when the US illegally moved to the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, there were, um, there were protests that happened in Jerusalem there were protests that happened in Haifa, and you'll recall this was, and there were protests obviously that were happening in Gaza because that was the time when Israel used the opportunity to gun down more than 60 Palestinians uh, on that very day. And, and so we, were, we saw that these protests were happening across the board. They were also happening in the West Bank. The reason I mention this is because I happened to be in the protest in Jerusalem on the day that they, the, the embassy move took place, and we saw this, this inauguration, this you know, totally toned up inauguration. And then the, the following evening and the next day in Haifa. And, uh, and those protests were massive. And they were protests that were, that were um, 
not only massive, but they were organized not by the traditional political parties, but by the youth movements, by head off, by others as well. So we've always seen this type of mobilization because as I said, you know, Palestinians understand that Israeli racism, apartheid, uh, discrimination, ethnic cleansing, it doesn't just stop at the green line that, that extends over. And so that's always been a common feature of the way that we have seen uh, protests take shape. In fact, there isn't one action that Israel commits that in, in one part of, of Palestine that doesn't have a reverberation in another part of Palestine. Whether it's annexation, you feel it in, you see protests happening in, uh, in inside 48, or the attacks on Gaza, again, you see them in, in 48 and in the West Bank. Um, or even the proper plan, the plan that was attempting to ethnically cleanse the Naqab, you again saw that there were protests that were taking place both in, in um, in the West Bank, including Jerusalem, obviously, and as, as well in Ghazi. What made things different this time was the, the fact that the Israelis um, touched Jerusalem. And what I mean by touching Jerusalem is that they did everything that they could possibly do to try to prevent Palestinians from being able to worship in Jerusalem during the holiest month of the, of the Islamic calendar. Um, and then not only that, but then did it make sure that they prevented Palestinians from worshiping during the holiest day of the holiest month of, of the Islamic calendar. And it was that that ended up mobilizing people from across, uh, getting even bigger protests than we had before. I really hope that this momentum uh, continues. My fear, however, is that the same structures that existed at the end of April um, are the same structures that exist today at the end of May, beginning of June. And that's where I would really love to see that there is something new and something different. And that youth who have been always at the forefront of, of these protests, that they begin to see that they have the ability to take a leadership role and not just um, sit back and wait. In terms of the Palestinian Authority, look, the Palestinian Authority did everything possible uh, to try to crush this until it was no longer crushable. And, uh, and I'm sure Maryam can speak to this better than I can because she's the person who's based in, in the West Bank, she's based in Ramallah. Uh, but one thing that was very clear was that they tried to co-opt these protests. The first part, as you mentioned, when, they, when the Israelis had put in these barricades in Jerusalem, preventing people from getting to, um, to Al-Aqsa, the Palestinian Authority tried to co-opt this and say that it was because of their great measures uh, that we saw that, this, that the, that the uh, gates were removed, you know, these barricades were removed. Obviously, that wasn't true. Then we saw a second phase where they tried to actually stop protests from happening, um, and that was earlier on, particularly as we began to see a response from, from, uh, from Gaza. And then the third phase of it was once again to go and, and uh, simultaneously co-opt and then try to crush these protests. And where we sit right now is we're on the crushing phase. They're using this opportunity, this, this you know, going back where, where people are just catching their breaths now to, to carry out mass arrests, just as the Israelis are carrying out mass arrests as well. Thank you, Diana, um, for putting all of this in, in perspective. Um, my next question is, is for um, Amjad. And um, just going back a little bit, um, in your opinion or assessment, what led to this um, unified youth activism or mobilization this time around in, in 2021? Um, and looking at Palestinian citizens in Israel in particular, um, is this an unprecedented level of mass mobilization and participation um, as we've seen in protests, marches and, and the strike and boycotts and so on? Um, what is the underlying, if you will, uh, what are the underlying conditions that brought us to this moment? Thank you, Tamara and the Arab Center and also real pleasure to be with uh, Diana and Miriam. Um, always wonderful to be in conversation with you too. Um, I want to echo, first of all, everything that Diana said. Uh, I might add, add, dig further, add, add some more details to the pieces that, um, that she excellently laid out. Um, the first thing to emphasize is the extent to which Jerusalem really played the central role in reviving and reawakening this activism. Uh, this is what I think has made this 
feel different. Um, the, the activism that we're seeing is not unprecedented per se. Um, again, like the past decade saw many of these flashes and episodes. The Second Intifada was, uh, I think, the most recent sort of um, uh, series of events that was almost relative to the scale. Um, and on all the decades before that, you know, these moments have happened. Um, but what has really led to this is, at least especially from the eyes of Palestinian citizens in 48, the fact that Jerusalem was now taking a central role in this reawakening was absolutely fundamental. You know, as Diana was explaining, the fact that you had these two kind of parallel uh, localized struggles, one was in Sheikh Jarrah, which was really being amplified um, you know, in the struggle against uh, the forcible expulsions in the neighborhood. And at the same time as that was happening, you also had the Al-Aqsa compound, a Damascus Gate, the Israeli police uh, repression uh, and restrictions were imposed there. And so, you know, what seemed like these fragmented pieces actually were interconnecting. And suddenly the, Ju the Jerusalemite neighborhoods, which, you know, Israel has done as much as it could to try to keep fragmenting, to separate it as much as possible, were now re we're reorganizing, we're reconnecting, we're restoring the, almost like the Palestinian unity within Jerusalem, uh, in spite of all the repression. So seeing that, and witnessing that, it was sort of like seeing the heartbeat of Palestine coming back to life in a way that, you know, has been brutally suppressed for, for many, many years. And that gave the lifeblood to Palestinian, to Palestinian communities on both sides of the Green Line and in diaspora. Like, like this is the best metaphor I can come up with to really see how much that, that uh, Palestinian political and social body has really, uh, has really come back to the fore. Um, to go a little deeper, um, you know, especially in, in the perspective of Palestinian citizens, you, know, there's, you sometimes have these periods of sort of dormancy uh, in our political activism. Uh, you know, it's hard to keep up the kind of protests that you've seen uh, in these past few weeks, but that never means that resistance in any way is, uh, is dying down. You have everything from political activism through the leadership, you have grassroots uh, outreach and organizing on the streets. And this is also in the face of numerous laws and policies that try to restrict that, that try to suppress that in many ways. Um, but what really clicked, I think, with a lot of young Palestinian citizens in this generation is that you know, since the 1990s, a lot of uh, you know, young Palestinians in their 20s and 30s, you know, they were promised uh, this idea of equality. They were promised this idea that, oh, there'll be some form of Palestinian liberation. There'll be some kind of solution. This was the idea that we were sold uh, the, uh, of the Oslo, in the Oslo era. And as time went by, we saw the extent to which this was a myth. We saw the extent to which it wasn't that we were even heading towards um, like a better future. In fact, the, the oppression was getting worse. Uh, this is not just, for example, that Gaza became under the severe blockade. Uh, the apartheid rule uh, from the river to the sea continued to be entrenched. Settlements continued to expand, but also inside 48, the Israeli Knesset and Israeli government were passing more explicitly racist discriminatory laws to entrench our inequality. Uh, and the epitome of that was the Jewish state law back in 2018, which is not hardly the first racist law in Israel, but it was sort of the culmination of what Israel has achieved. So as time went by, that vision, that idea we were sold was completely erased. And just in the past year alone, the extent to which you know, you've had uh, normalization between Israel and Arab states. You've had the effects of the Trump, uh, the Trump plan being put out in practice, the entrenchment of Israeli apartheid, and the complete failure of the Palestinian leadership, culminating in the failure uh, of even Palestinian Authority elections, with all the problems that it would have, that, you know, that it suffered from. But the fact that even that couldn't go through, all that combines to remind Palestinians, including 48, that we're very much on our own, and that we needed to take the helm of the struggle back into our hands. That we, that we spent the last two, three decades trying to look for as much help and support as possible, which is needed in the end, that solidarity is required, international action is required. But what we really saw extraordinarily in these past few weeks is the extent to which Palestinians have come out to the streets, uh, and especially these young Palestinians who everyone thought would sort of forget their identity, would not be so demanding, would sort of get sucked into the sort of socioeconomic lifestyle that, you know, that's better than our previous generations, but the young Palestinians came out and said, absolutely not. Um, and so that revival of that pulse was really crucial. And this is not only in terms of the identity that's awakening, but also the extent to which we could see the one state reality that we were all living under. You know, at the same time that uh, Israeli fighter jets were bombarding Gaza, you had the Israeli army also firing live bullets at protesters in the West Bank. And at the same time, you had Israeli police uh, brutally repressing Palestinian protests inside Israel invading people's homes, conducting these mass arrests, which are still continuing to this day, 
even had these kind of lynch mobs, uh, like you're mentioning tomorrow, you know, actively going out to assault and harass and, uh, and destroy the properties of Palestinian citizens. And the police would either stand idly by or join these mobs in those assaults. And so in seeing that sort of synchronized violence, regardless if you had that citizenship, regardless of which side of the Green Line you're on, was this very clear reminder to Palestinian youth who already know the kind of regime that they're in, but to, to see the extent to which they will never be welcomed here. They can never achieve equality. They might be able to get certain rights here and there, but in the end, the Israeli regime is there to tell them, get back into your cages. And this was a message that Palestinian citizens got. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of pause here. Oh, well, actually, just, sorry, just one more thing to add, I suppose. You mean, uh, and the extent to which this was really been channeled was very evident in the general strike that, uh, that happened last month. Uh, usually when general strikes are inside 48, they're often, in the past few years, they've hardly been followed. They're always almost exclusively inside Israel. They're kind of these non-events that are called for by the traditional leadership. The fact that young activists took the date that was announced for the strike and said, we want to strike all across historic Palestine, and it was almost overwhelmingly uh, followed, shows the extent of that power and demonstrated to Palestinian citizens and Palestinians across the world that you can reclaim that power. You don't need to rely on, the, on your leadership. You don't need to rely on the international community. We can take that uh, into ourselves. Uh, I'm sure we'll speak about this more, but I'll pause there for now. Thank you, Amjad. And um, um, as you mentioned, this synchronized violence was a reminder um, for all Palestinians of the shared struggle that um, they're facing. Um, and now I would like to move to Maryam and maybe build on that a little bit and focus on Palestinian um, youth in, in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. Um, Maryam, what is the, the, the role of um, young Palestinians in um, the social and political um, atmosphere um, under the oppressive uh, measures of the Palestinian Authority, as Diana mentioned? And um, has this um, absence of the Palestinian Authority in Jerusalem played a role in, in the least recent um, wave of mobilization? And um, if you could also um, touch a little bit on the role of Palestinian youth in the international context through um, you know, connecting, sharing on social media and speaking to the mainstream media, are they um, um, you know, changing the perceptions and um, playing a, a role in, in this shift that we're seeing um, internationally. Thank you, Tamara. Um, and I wanna reaffirm uh, my thanks also to be on this uh, panel. And, and I wanna remind that a lot of us are being grateful that we're all sharing spaces because we are divided. So the fact that we are centering Palestinian voices from everywhere is, is both humbling and a reflection, I think, of the successes that we've seen recently. Um, and, and I really appreciate these questions because they recontextualize what's happening. So I don't, I've been trying to move away from this uh, concept of uh, the leadership, the questions on leadership, right? I look at them more as representatives and right now Palestinians are saying, well, they don't actually represent us. So we're moving forward in that direction. And I think that's the change is that Oftentimes we may um, look at leadership as you know um, symbols that cannot be touched, but we're saying, no, 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 in the end, you're representative. Um, and in terms of the absence of the Palestinian Authority in Jerusalem, I don't know if that really has a role to play in kind of the political representation of Palestinians as much as it does in, you know, for Palestinians, they're completely abandoned. In Jerusalem, they have no protection, and they are protecting each other. Um, and that's also the rise in community. What we are seeing is a rise and a coming together uh, in community. And of course, so I don't think youth are taking a very visible role as a signifier of of you know our strength or a signifier of our fearlessness. It's because we we constitute the majority of the population. 22% um, of Palestinians are between 18 and 29, and 45% are under the age of 18. So you have around 67% of our population, and I'm only counting um, the West Bank and the Gaza because we don't even have the right to carry a census. 
um, for Palestinians with Israeli citizenship and in diaspora, which we have limited access to. But 67% of those here are under the age of 29. Um, and that on its own has been, you know, a force to be reckoned with because this is um, the, the age group where we envision things, where we don't look at, um, you know, the offered solutions as uh, the only option, right? We're recreating options, we're, we're imagining. And I think there's a misconception, especially for youth, in terms of taking, um, you know, the role in the political process, right? I think it's an informal informal role, but it is more impactful um, than, than the formal frameworks that we've often seen being worked under. I mean, the United Nations was created, what, 1949, um, in tandem with the creation of the State of Israel. So it shows you how these frameworks are very abstract and youth are daring to move towards concrete um, realities because these past 73 years weren't only just the colonization that we're experiencing, we've spent them imagining together. Um, and, and right now, what we're trying to do is bring that imagination to the forefront. One of the strongest things in terms of the media discourse change, um, and this is my, my personal opinion in it, is that we're less, it's, the change isn't happening now. Right, we often think change is a moment. We're a reflection of the changes that already happened. And right now there are changes happening that will only be reflected towards you know, the future, which is why Palestinians say, keep the momentum up. Do not lose heart and have nefas twil. You know, make sure that in Arabic we say nefas twil, meaning it's gonna be a long process. You need to take our time. We don't wanna burn out. Um, in the end, we are people with families, with lives uh, that are coming together. But more than this, more, half of the Palestinian diaspora doesn't have access to Palestine, but at the same time, they've transcended the boundaries of land and territory and brought back the question to what it is. This is what colonialism is. This is what ethnic cleansing is. It does not have to be an Israeli soldier shooting us um, or quote unquote neutralizing us as the Israeli military often says, it is killing our identity. It is killing our ability to relate to one another. For the first time I'm hearing Palestinian youth share experiences from Lid to Haifa to the refugee camps in Lebanon to um, American uh, citizens who are Palestinian that were put on things like the Canary Mission in the US so that they can be banned entry to their home, so that they can be denied jobs. So Israel's um, attack and attempt to ethnically cleanse is not limited to the ways or the boundaries that were here in Palestine. Um, and I think that's also helped push us forward. But more than this, let's move beyond exceptionalizing us and exceptionalizing Palestine. There is, there is a tangible shift happening, I think. Um, and a lot of us are hesitant to see or admit it because we just don't want to bring our hopes back up again because we've been betrayed so much. But the world has been up in rising and, and protesting and rebelling against many of the different um, oppressive forces around us. And this is why I think we have seen more solidarity in the international community. It is not just about Palestine. It is about this system and it is a labyrinthine system um, that tries to silence us. And then in terms of the coverage, especially mainstream media, and I think the confrontation that we are seeing right now um, from Palestinians, we the questions have become predictable. It is the same exact question where we all become spokespeople for either Hamas or, or spokespeople against the corruption of the Palestinian Authority. And we're trying to bring it to more simpler terms to showcase that in the end, what is being fought is a settler colonialism. Um, and, and that's what we're speaking out against. Uh, we're, we're, we found the language, we found the voice because we shared each other's experiences and other struggles. Israel capitalized a lot on our inability to reach out to the international community. 
This wasn't, it didn't happen just with a siege that is 15 years long on Gaza or the fact that our borders here, my exit and entry from Palestine is controlled by um, Israel or even Palestinians with Israeli citizenship who are humiliated at the airport. They are racially profiled. And, and if a soldier decides not to let them leave or enter, they have the right. Um, uh, so it's, it's showing how all of this targeted attacks also allowed us to create a new language. One which we refuse to compromise on because the moment we start compromising on that is where we falter into the political discourse where the Oslo Accords happen. And the younger generation, we are the generation that was born under Oslo. So all we've known is, okay, well, this framework clearly doesn't work. You know, I've spent 25 years of my life under it, it's time for change. And that's what we're doing. The first step is let's stop downplaying it. You know, we're really not gonna stay quiet anymore because our lives depend on it. As, as Sheikh Jarrah is happening, so is Silwan. As Silwan is happening, so is Walaje in Beit Lahim. So are the areas around the West Bank in Area C. And settlers have become so emboldened that they'll, they'll just come out with their gun and shoot at you. Impu complete impunity here and complete impunity abroad. When right now there's a criminalization happening, and I'm so sorry I'm taking so long, but criminalization happening with the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. This is a nonviolent movement. And then at the same time, people are asking me about Hamas, but you're, you're literally criminalizing the voices that are trying to say, I don't want to be complicit in settler colonialism. Palestine, what we're doing is, we're so much more basic than the politicians and the diplomats and a lot of the jargon that kind of confuses um, public spaces. And we're saying, no, no, it's a lot simpler than that. And we, we really can't afford um, the luxury of even entertaining it right now. I think that's the difference. That's what's happening. I'm so sorry I took so long. We're also not used to having so much space to express ourselves. I think we're all getting used to it. I mean, I'm just in bed, I agree to this, I suppose. <laughs> Always thrilled to hear from you, Mariam. And space without hostility. This is the, <laughs> the other part of it. Right. Well, thank you, Mariam. And um, I, I appreciate this um, hopeful, albeit a little um, cautious tone. Um, but speaking of, you know, this international solidarity and, and finding the voice and creating new language um, and, and, you know, seeing a vision outside of, of this, the current status quo, I want to move to the next round of questions and focus on um, the prospects of change, um, you know, whether the Palestinian youth in today's political climate can be involved or lead um, about the Palestinian national movement and in confronting the ongoing Israeli occupation and, and discriminatory policies, but also the um, complicity of the international community and, and US support. Um, I'd like to start with Amjad. Um, so are we seeing a transformative moment in Palestinian politics today? Um, what follows um, this momentum? And looking at the big picture of um, the Palestinian struggle, how significant is this um, unified uh, mass activism for um, you know, the, the, the struggle for rights and freedoms for all Palestinians? Yeah, um, and honestly, it's very early to tell. Um, the, um, or this, you know, the, this energ energization of the movement is literally only a few weeks old. Um, and, uh, and to be frank, there's nothing inevitable about where this movement will head or its victory it might be short lived, it might be very long lived. Um, you know, it depends on the repression that's being targeted against us, it depends on the continued mobilization. Um, the good news, I think, is that this is understood by the Palestinians who are going out, who went out to the streets, and the Palestinians who are really uh, leading this. You know, even though, um, especially in the, the two weeks of the intense, you know, the, the most intense two weeks, but especially when Gaza was being bombarded and the people going out to the streets, although that has, you know, quote unquote, calmed down, you know, you're still having many uh, policies and repression still carrying on, but the Palestinian activists themselves are, st are still in conversation and still continue to talk about what do we do next? There's a very clear understanding that, you know, the protests could never be enough and they can't be enough. 
Uh, but this is why, for example, you had, you know, the, you had the general strike that was announced to say that, you know, and it's not just about shutting down your doors of the shops, but that we're having cultural activities. We're having know your rights workshops. We're uh, getting in touch with Palestinians across the green line and we're asking allies abroad to be a part of it. That strike was a huge success. And so it's like, okay, so what happens next? And so now, for example, there's now a campaign encouraging Palestinians to buy Palestinian products uh, and not to uh, buy just like Israeli, Israeli products, everything from milk cartons to even going to Israeli malls, depending on you know whether you're on this side of the green line, if, even if you're in the West Bank, if you're using Israeli products, go buy from your local Palestinian farmer, uh, buy milk that's produced by a, you know, by a Palestinian um, uh, store and so on and so forth. It's, and it's the idea of like, you know, let's get a taste of what, what self-sufficiency and economic empowerment is like. And this is incredible to see. And again, it's not the first time these sort of things have happened, but to see, but it's like, let, how do we keep up this momentum? Um, you know, we're not asking everyone to keep showing up and fighting the police on the streets, but like, how do we, how can we do this in very creative ways? So this is extraordinary to see. Um, and, you know, and, and it's important that, you know, while there is this amazing proactive activism, the repression is still ongoing. Um, again, we were just mentioning the fact that inside 48, the Israeli police are still arresting Palestinian citizens who took part in these demonstrations. Um, I can almost guarantee that members of the Knesset right now, uh, especially in this new government that's now been signed on uh, last night, that many of them are going to be considering what kind of legislation can we pass in order to make it harder for Palestinian citizens to come out to the streets the next time this happens. Uh, what other ways, what other emergency or security powers can we grant the police uh, to essentially become a more militarized version uh, of, you know, of state repression, to kind of almost make them mimic even more the Israeli army and, and uh, authoritarian powers that they oper operate in the West Bank and Gaza. Because we've seen this before. Every time there is that resistance, there, there's a massive Israeli state pushback. And so it's very difficult uh, to know what's going to happen. And like I said, th there's no guarantee, but I think that is offering a lot of um, kind of energy and mobilization and the fact that these conversations are happening not just among the youth but even the older older generations you know who didn't have the kind of resources that the young people have now and we talked about social media for example social media is not only you know allowing Palestinians to connect with each other but to kind of articulate their cause uh, to people abroad um, you know and this goes for even like media outlets and policymakers whereby in the past you used to sort of take like Israeli uh, Army's press statement about oh this is what happened in Gaza or this is what's been going on in the streets of Haifa, but in but on social media you're seeing Palestinians, you know, put up their own testimonies, their own photographs, their own videos of what's been going on, the bombardments, the assaults, and so on. And so, forth. so they're immediately countering the sort of state narrative that that everything is fine or that we're controlling the situation and it's the Palestinians who are causing the problems. So we're providing the truth uh, in that narrative, and this I think is really help, this is really crucial for the international community. Um, like I said, international journalists, I think, um, in ways that, that I haven't seen quite a long time or in several years, there really was a proactive effort, for example, to get Palestinians on the record, to get their voices to be out there. Uh, and this is crucial for the public discourse, but it's also crucial for uh, the policy makers and politicians, that the more that Palestinians are, are are being able to speak and assert themselves through every means necessary, it's also putting policymakers into a corner. They will, many of them, especially in the United States and Europe, will still, um, uh, you know, try to find their way to keep providing that support in, uh, to Israel. As we saw, even Congress now is like literally thinking of more ways to give more arms and more military funding to the state. But this pressure is building. You can feel it. And again, this will be faced with backlash. But I think that's been a very, very positive, uh, um, a very positive tr uh, trend to see. Um, and insofar as the unity, you know, it's one thing for the Palestinian political leadership. The traditional leaders who are clearly not interested in, in proper unity, but because we're seeing that grassroots unity, I think that uh, coming back to what Manning was saying, like that's a different idea of leadership, that's a different idea of organizing politics. And in many ways, you know, what's been the movement of these past few weeks is, mu is as much in defiance of their traditional leaders as it is against the Israeli state um, and its colonial regime. Um, so I think this is, you know, if, if there's any hope in that unity, if there's any hope in that, it's it's understanding to kind of decentralize that power. And to, and to mobilize it, you know, in every town, in every neighborhood, on every Twitter page, and so on and so forth. Um, and time will tell if that will, you know, if that can continue to build up to something uh, even more sustainable. 
Um, thank you, Amjad. And um, just speaking of um, this power in the decentralization of, of these movements, I want to go back to um, Maryam um, a little bit. And you know, we've we've heard a lot of questions about you know, is there going to be a new young leadership emerging from this? Um, what's happening to um, you know young people? in um, different parts of, of Palestinian communities who are fed up um, and have been becoming more and more active. Um, do we need leadership? As, as Amjad said, maybe this decentralization is, is um, an opportunity uh, rather than a shortcoming. Um, and if you could touch a little bit about on um, young people in Gaza, I think you know, we, we, were, we tried to get someone um, on this panel from Gaza, but we weren't able to this time. So I think it would be important to, to bring some of that perspective as well. Thank you, Amjad, for um, all the points really that you made, um, uh, and Kamada for, for building on that. So in terms of leadership, um, we really have to also kind of humble this idea of leadership. I think leadership is rising in different areas in Palestine. So you see, you know, people taking lead in the legal sector, people taking lead um, in the different areas, but what, what is really leading us, our leadership is our goal. And our goal right now is to be free and to be able to say, I wanna be free without being punished for it. Um, and, and, and that's, I think what's happening, it is rising. Now in terms of representatives who, who will kind of represent, um, Palestinians as a people, uh, let, let us bring the people back first, right? Before that happens, because I do genuinely believe that circumstance will impose itself and leadership will rise um, with it. Let's also not impose on, on Palestinians, especially what I've seen from, from those who have been very vocal and have you know political backgrounds. There's this imposition that they become leaders too, but None of us are really in this to be something or do something. We're really in this to live um, and to live on our land. So it's, it's really important to humble that. And, and I, I'm sure that I also think touched on something very important that there is kind of this reframing um, of politics. There's also this reframing of governance and representation in a way that brings it back uh, to, to the population itself. Right. And right now, what we've seen, especially with the, the calls on censorship of Palestinians and Palestinian content, is um, how it's, it's so important to just keep things visible right now to be able to see where things are rising and where they're not, um, especially as a confrontation of this isolation tactic that Israel uses on a physical boundary level. But the international community, community is using by not letting um, people have their right to access information. And I genuinely believe people are smart enough to know what's happening on their own if they have access to the information. The, and, and this is especially because we've all kind of became civilian journalists right now. Uh, and keep in mind, this is happening after a pandemic where there was difficulty for many international journalists to come, which required that we reclaim our voice and it required them that if they wanted to cover Palestine, well, they needed access here. And that happened through us. Um, so I also think the timing is important in terms of Gazan bringing that voice in. Yeah, let's, let's start talking about Gaza as part of Palestine, not a sovereign state that is at war um, with another state, Israel. No, these are five Palestinian governors that have been under siege for 15 years. Let us say there are five Palestinian governors, if Gaza scares everyone so much because everyone's associating it with Hamas. And that was the, the success of the Israeli narrative. Um, it, it overshadowed all of it. Um, in terms of international solidarity, keep Palestinians safe. Um, stop funding our bullets and our bombing and US military aid, that is mostly military aid, $3.8 billion. Let's invest that maybe in not having um, American police shoot down black youth in the US. Um, let's invest that in education. I know the students in the US are under complete debt. Maybe put it there because it's killing us. 
Um, and it also helped fund uh, a nuclear plant for Israel. So it's, it's not just a response. This is really a regional um, risk and attack on humanity in general. Uh, we've seen what nuclear powers do. And right now, the emboldenment of the settler movement and Naftali Bennett becoming, you know, prime minister who's very blatant about kill, shoot to kill um, the Arabs. I'm sorry, can't even say Palestinian. Um, and, and it stopped, yeah, the funding. Call for sanctions. And right now we are seeing it happen not at the policy level, but by the imposition for policymakers here. It happened by trade unionists um, refusing to send arms to Palestine to be used against us. Um, it is, we see it in uh, students speaking out and being kicked out of university from places like the UK and the US that pride themselves in democracy. Um, so let's keep, keep us safe. And by us, I don't just mean me or Amjad or Dana or Palestinians here. Keep us safe because I see the attacks that are happening on journalists that want to cover this right. I see the attacks happening on activists that are saying I have the right to boycott. I am seeing the attacks on students and teenagers and kids being called terrorists because they can say Palestine because they're braver than a lot of people I have seen speak on Palestine. Um, and I think that's really important in bringing with, with the question of should we bring Gaza to the conversation? Yes, amplify, amplify each other. This was the success, one of the successes that we've had. We're all amplifying each other. Um, across the spectrum in different spheres, we're also not confining ourselves to one mechanism of resistance. And we're, le we're legitimizing our right to resist. Um, as any group that has been oppressed will tell you, if there, is a, if there is someone pointing a gun at you and you wanna live, you're gonna fight to live, right? Um, and, and, and that's really what's happening. So support one another. If there's an employer kicking someone out for speaking about Palestine, come together and find them another job or speak with that employer. If it's basic, you know, the, the community support Amjad was talking about, that, that's why we're still here. Um, it reminds me a lot of the stories I heard of the first Intifada, but right now we're hoping it doesn't get hijacked. Um, so that's, that's what we we're telling everyone around the world, come together with any different way, um, but let's keep us safe. Thank you, Maryam. And um, I want to pick up on, on your point about US military aid and, um, you know, the propositions of sanctions. Um, and uh, I want to move to Diana. Um, what is the, the role of the international community in, in the current state of affairs, and, and especially after years of cuddling um, the Israeli uh, former, maybe Israeli Prime Minister, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu? Um, is there a substantial change in, in, um, in foreign policies or in, in you know, representatives rather than administrations? Is there a change in the, in the Biden administration's rhetoric uh, regarding Palestine and Israel that um, can be considered hopeful? And um, how significant are the voices of um, the progressive members of US Congress? Um, we know that the first Palestinian American woman, um, Rashida Talib, is in Congress, and she's played an important role here. But um, many others um, who have um, supported, um, you know, some uh, legis introduced legislation in support of Palestinian rights. Um, are, is this ultimately? Um, does this have the potential for pushing uh, for sanctions or change on the ground? Thank you very much, uh, Tamara. It's a very good question. Look, the, I, I think it's important for us to distinguish between the international diplomatic community and the international community, meaning you, me, and everybody else. The international diplomatic community is still saying the same things that they've been saying before, like the same stuff they, they were saying in, in April is the same stuff they're saying in May and the same stuff that they're saying now in June. And the reason is, is because they are so far behind the times when it comes to where the world is, when it, com when, when it comes to all of these issues. So for example, it may have been okay for them back in 2014 to condemn Palestinians for their own deaths. 
um, they're using that same approach today, whereas the rest of the world has open, opened up its eyes and seen that this isn't a question of Palestinians being blamed for their own deaths, but there is an actual actor being Israel, and that it's not just the actor Israel, but that actor is being emboldened by the United States, it's being emboldened by Europe, it's being emboldened by Canada, it's being emboldened by um, certain countries in Latin America, and so on. And, uh, and so I think there, I don't think that we've seen a substantial shift yet on the part of the international diplomatic community, but I do think that that shift is going to come because if you think back to the period of apartheid in South Africa, when we saw that the big push came not from the international diplomatic community, but came from these from civil society, came from the, from the push by, that was happening on the part of the ANC, et cetera, that um, we ended up seeing that the change happened by international donors or international actors, international countries, international representatives at a later stage. In other words, it was the people that were leading and the leaders that were following. And I think the same thing is happening when it comes to Palestine. I fully expect that, in fact, we've already seen it, uh, that they are going to go back to business as usual, trying to prop up an illegitimate president named Mahmoud Abbas, um, trying to push forward reconstruction through him to try to give him some semblance of legitimacy, even though he's no longer legitimate. And they're going to continue to use the same talking points that they used in, in the 90s, in the year 2000, in the, in the 2010s, and in uh, 2020, and so on. In fact, I, I sometimes joke that you can copy paste a statement from the, from the late 90s um, and just change the date uh, to today's date, and you'll see substantially the same wording with just a few little changes here and there. This is definitely the case when it comes to Silwan, which uh, we've been seeing the ethnic cleansing take place there since the, since the 90s, and, and the same language is uh, continually used. When it comes to the coddling, this part is also very important. I don't think that we're going to see an end to the coddling uh, now that Netanyahu is potentially out. And the reason is, is that so many people are viewing this with a sigh of relief. I'm not, just to be clear for the record, I'm not viewing Netanyahu's departure with a sigh of relief because Naftali Bennett is just as bad, if not worse. This is not a question of the person, it's a question of the structures. And, but for many within the international community, they're viewing it simply in terms of the person. And the, the potential departure of Netanyahu is going to be greeted with, uh, with a, a red carpet for the Bennets, for the Lapides, for the other people who come along, who, who share the exact same vision, if not worse, than Netanyahu shares. So I suspect that th those years of coddling are going to continue. And in fact, it's a little surprise to me that we're now seeing the request for a billion dollars by Congress uh, to Congress um, on the part to replenish Iron Dome. It's a little surprise to me that we saw that $735 million um, packet, aid package to go through Israel. N none of this is at all surprising because this is we're now going to be entering the phase of a new phase of coddling, where it's not just coddling Israel, but it's coddling the replacement to Netanyahu. In terms of uh, Biden, have I seen a substantial change in language? N no. I, I, you know, there were some changes in language, and I think that um, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that there were some changes in, in language. Was it substantial? No. Um, and and I, I think that we, we, we don't have to have such a low ceiling any longer, where we're looking and saying, uh, you know, oh, he said he said both Palestinians and Israelis need to be living in in security. Eh, so what? Um, if that's where if that's where the where the ceiling is, I think we need to be pushing it further. Of course, I'm always told that what happens behind the scenes is so different from what happens in um, in front of the camera and and so on and so forth. But I cannot discount the fact that that the United States um, blocked four UN Security Council resolutions when they didn't need to block those four UN Security Council resolutions. And lastly, when it comes to progressive members of Congress, it's wonderful to see, and I'm delighted that there are so many people who are pushing within the United States to change those policies and to change party politics. Um, I, and I, I want to continue to see that. I don't think that we should overinflate it, nor do I think we should de like discount it in any way. I'm, all I want to say is that I'm delighted to see that these voices are coming through 
and that it's not just coming through, by the way, when it comes to those specific voices that, that we had expected to hear from, but it's also through other people who, whose eyes are now open and who are beginning to make the connections between, um, between what it is that Israel is doing and what uh, the United States has been promoting globally as well. Thank you, Diana, for this uh, dose of reality. Um, we do have a lot of questions coming in and it's time for um, the audience's questions, uh, which we'll spend the next 30 minutes or so um, addressing. Um, what I'm gonna do is maybe um, present three questions at a, at a time and give you, all of you a chance to respond just so we can take as many questions as possible. Um, the first question is from uh, journalist, Natalie Glazo. Um, She's asking, um, is there any hope of um, coordinating youth in exile and in occupied Palestine um, to decide to form a political party? So that's kind of touching on the, the leadership questions that we've, we've addressed a little bit, but also um, to have a voice in the Palestinian parliament or the Knesset. Um, and also, uh, She's asking about um, what's taking uh, the Arab List Party and, and, in, and participating in the new government. Um, what can we expect from the um, Lapid Bennett uh, uh, Bureau? Uh, the, next, the next question from Kristen Rorig um, is asking, um, she's uh, an international policy fellow at the Presbyterian Church USA, and she's asking um, Amjad and anyone else, um, how the framing of journalism and media uh, has changed in light of the recent um, events. Um, are American international journalists using different language? And I think uh, I'm just touched on this a little bit if, if you'd like to expand. Um, next question from Nancy Butto, and she's asking, um, when will the Palestinian Authority recognize the work of young Palestinians and call for elections? Um, so that's again, um, a question of, of leadership. And um, another question I'd like to um, just throw in, a question from Lori King, a member of our uh, academic advisory board. She's asking, how can we keep the ball bouncing in the US, particularly working with people in Congress? And a related question from um, um, Stephen um, Longdon. What is um, the most effective activities um, for those um, in Europe and the US that they can undertake to support Palestinians in the short and medium term? Okay, so that's a lot of questions. Um, maybe we can start with um, Amjad and then we move to the next. Sure, uh, I'll kick off with, um, with the question about uh, how framing has changed in uh, international media. Um, I think we touched on this in Maryam, I think also, um, articulated this in how how much the past few weeks uh, to, to kind of repackage what you're saying. Um, th there is a sense that there's been almost like a kind of unshackling among many Palestinians about the language and the discourse that they're using. Uh, you know, words like settler colonialism and apartheid, of course, you know these are not new. They've been around for a very long time. They've been diagnosed, um, you know, from grassroots activists to NGO reports to intellectual to the you know to political leaderships. Um, and to see Palestinians, you know, take from to Twitter, to Facebook, to Instagram, and use it unabashedly, um, and to say, you know, you know, I mean, all these kind of represent different kinds of elements of oppression, but they're all part and part of the same ideology, the same regime. Uh, we can't, you know, think of, and even among Palestinians where we sometimes internalize our fragmentation sometimes, there was this reassertion of like, we can't do that anymore. We, we have to, we, we have to get back onto that common pulse. Um, and actually, and so on, on there, oh, there's this kind of proactive effort by Palestinians to ensure that khalas, we're using settler colonialism, we're using apartheid, and we'll do everything we need to, to get that on the public discourse, you know, uh, in one way or another. At the same time that you have this, uh, this unshackling happening and this really this complete um, letting go of inhibitions on this language, actually international media, at least in a lot of outlets I saw, were actually receptive to this. 
the deceased settler colonialism in, uh, in I think the Washington Post article that Maryam wrote with Noura uh, a few weeks ago was like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it was the first or last, if it was the first time per se, but it was just extraordinary that in that moment, yes, this is a language that we're using. And that article was precisely about that we're not, you know, we're not playing this, this old ball game anymore. Um, and also my, uh, my colleague at 972 Magazine, Henriette Chakla, she's spoken on, uh, on the podcast where she phrased it sort of like these words actually are making it past the editor's desks. Uh, you know, that even editors and journalists themselves who are reviewing these op-eds that are coming in are like, yes, apartheid, yes, settler colonialism. So there is this kind of uh, dialectic that's, that's suddenly happening that I think really catapulted uh, this discourse and these uh, diagnoses in a way that hasn't, you know, that took a lot of organizing for years. It took a lot of uh, attempts by Palestinians to break the, those barriers set by international media outlets. Uh, first being shamed or being forced to self-censor, uh, to be concerned about the kind of backlash. Um, and it's not to say, and in the end, words do matter. And these are debates that Palestinians are debating first and foremost on how to articulate them, how do they uh, align with each other, where sometimes some of the problems with using settler colonialism and apartheid for ourselves, yeah, I mean, or even how to articulate, but these are live debates that are all happening and they're all legitimate. Um, but just to have that out there in the international level is absolutely extraordinary. And I think we really saw that shift. Um, and you know, I, I was worried that I was only getting this in my my bubbles, but but to see, I did see, or at least I got the sense, and maybe my my colleagues agree, there are way more Palestinians writing, you know, being even allowed to write op-eds in mainstream outlets. Journalists were reaching out to Palestinians, you know, in much greater numbers than I remember, uh, at least a lot, along amongst a lot of colleagues and activists that, that I've seen. And I think a huge part of this is credit um, uh, to many, you know, to the years of organizing been done and to the use of social media, but also I think I want to credit um, I think last year, especially among American outlets, the Black Lives Movement uh, and the, uh, re the re-energization of it last, last year after the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, I think really forced a lot of conversations among US outlets about how do we narrate Black struggle? Are we prioritizing Black voices to articulate that struggle? Uh, what assumptions and what, how are we contributing to a discourse that actually empowers power dynamics rather than challenges them? And this connects to what Mariam was saying about, you know, in the end, this is beyond Palestine. This is a struggle and a conversation that's happening across many, um, you know, different countries and different societies across the world. And so to know that, at least insofar as the U.S. media outlets, that that conversation happened last year, where we could see the kind of uh, ramifications of that conversation happening in Palestine, even if it was just for a few weeks, and even now journalists are sort of dying down in their reporting of Palestine, but it was extraordinary to see. So I do think that framing and that shift is huge, it's fundamental. And now the question is coming down to, um, and I think this was kind of related to one of the questions I was asked about how do you keep the ball bouncing and how to keep it rolling, is to keep up that momentum. That don't just come to talk about Palestine whenever there is a bombardment of Gaza. It's crucial and important. And we understand that, you know, it's one of the more intense times where this does happen, but what ha what's happening the day after? What does blockade, what is blockade doing to the Palestinians in, in Gaza right now? What are the people? What about the people who are injured, maimed, who lost their houses? You know, and this is just in Gaza alone. Think also in the West Bank. What's happening now in, in inside 48, where Palestinian citizens are still getting arrested? There's always a day after, and it's not the kind of the hot violence of um, you know of bombs and bullets, etc. But there's still this slow, cold violence that's still operating every single day, and that's where the attention needs to be, and that's the most important part because. Part of what allows Israeli colonialism or Israeli apartheid to continue is this using of the slow violence, of this quiet, quote unquote, violence. Uh, to today, everything's fine, everything's calm, everything's normal, nothing to see here. You need to keep that lens there. You need to keep that magnifying glass there. And the easiest way to do this in the end is media. You know, echoing what Diana said, we don't know how politicians and policymakers are gonna react in the coming years. And there is obviously this pushback but as, as much as we can take the public narrative and the public discourse in our hands and using media to our advantage from social media to mainstream outlets, that at least is one key, uh, key avenue to do all that. Um, thank you, Amjad. Um, Maryam and Diana, would you like to um, answer some of those questions in the first round? Maryam? Yeah, um, I just want to kind of... Um add in terms of the shift in media uh, and keeping the ball rolling, especially when it comes to Congress. Uh, so there is a shift happening in media. 
uh, not just on the coverage of Palestine, but journalists reclaiming their right to report on Palestine. Like we saw um, the way the Associated Press covered the bombing of its own offices in Gaza, as if initially it was reported as if the buildings just got dizzy and collapsed um, instead of they got bombed by an Israeli military. Um, and this is about their colleagues, you know? So the, the pressures that media um, outlets are facing as well as coming out. Um, so journalists are reclaiming their right to cover Palestine. We saw um, the firing, you know, of, of Emily Wilder, for instance, uh, and, and the cases just keep coming up. And I'm certain if you speak to any veteran that covered Palestine, that they'll speak to you of the pressures that they face. Um, so there's a shift happening at a more rooted level as well, I think, not just the language that we're, we're using. Um, and, and in terms of keeping the ball uh, rolling in Congress, I just wanna to touch on this and that it's crucial to do it. And it, it does have to do with language as well and simple basics like, um, why don't we write Palestinians uh, with Israeli citizenship in, 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 in the official de department like documents? Why is that not written in policy? Why do they keep referring to us as Israeli Arabs? Let's formalize that. Let's formalize that recognition. Um, that's a first step. And I think it's an easy step uh, to do and to take, but it is important to keep it going. If, if not for Palestinians to just reclaim um, any legitimacy that you know, the US has in terms of actually holding pressure uh, on Israel instead of trying to mediate this like the conflict that we all hear. Um, and the final thing I just want to touch up on was a question about uh, bringing in Palestinians uh, into, you know, parliament. Pa I want to answer the Palestinian parliament section, not Knesset. Um, I don't think, uh, you know, that goes anywhere as we've seen. But in terms of um, bringing them as representatives, yes, it's necessary. I think there is hope. Um, to do that, in what mechanism that happens, we're yet to tell, and it's also up to us to really decide um, on that. But yeah, thank you. Um, Diana? Yeah, I'm happy to answer the question about about the Knesset uh, in terms of what, it's, it's probably a whole uh, webinar in and of itself, but I'll answer it very quickly. Um, which is to say, what do I expect to see from Lapid uh, and Bennett? Um, the same, if not worse. And the reason I'm saying this is that even though we have now seen the United Arab List uh, sign on to this coalition backing it, um, I, I think they did this because they effectively had to, because it was a losing party. Um, let me make clear that that Mansour Abbas, the person who leads this list, it was not welcome in any of the protests, whether it was in Sheikh Jarrah or in Haifa or in Nazareth or in any of the places. He was specific, there were specific uh, press releases that were sent out saying that he was a person who was not welcome to attend these protests because his position has been one of capitulation. It hasn't been one of standing with the Palestinian community that is inside Israel that is facing daily discrimination. And so his, uh, his false attempt at, oh, I'm not sure if I'm gonna sign or whatever, it's just, it's a bluff. And, the, and, though, and Lapid and, and Bennett both know it. Um, and so, the, so although they, he got some quote unquote assurances, I'm pretty sure that those assurances are going to last as about, about as far as Israel is as a democracy, which is they won't last because Israel's not a democracy. Um, and so I think that we're going to see very quickly that he's going to get burned. And instead, there's going to be an attempt. He's going to have to have a, a, a reality check about asking himself whether it's worth it, whether his sole goal was to simply get rid of Netanyahu, which may have been his goal, as well as political survival, or whether he's actually representing the Palestinian community that is, in, that is inside Israel that is facing daily apartheid and racism. So I'm not expecting that they're going to do anything positive when it comes to Palestinians. You know, I wanna make very clear that when it comes to all of these political parties that, um, th that are on the center all the way to the right and including labor, by the way, there is longstanding agreement on one thing, which is how much they want to crush Palestinians. 
Um, so there are there are no differences of opinions when it comes to when it comes to Palestinians. They're all united in this. And so this new coalition was simply a, a, a question of removing Netanyahu. It was, it's not a debate about policies or positions or about what uh, or the identity of Israel or whether Israel believes in whether they want to see equal rights or not equal rights or end the occupation. These are not debate questions inside Israel. All that is the debate question inside Israel is um, the question of who is it that's at the helm and that's it. Even the, the parties that are considered right wing are right wing when it comes to Palestinians. They're not fiscally right wing. They're not conservative right wing parties. They are, they're right wing only when it comes to Palestinians. And, sim and also when it comes to centrist, the centrist parties are, um, are extremely right wing when it, comes to, when it comes to Palestinians. So I don't expect anything that is going to happen here. As for the question of elections, when will elections in the Palestinian Authority happen? Um, this remains to be seen. I think that the, what, the, what the next move that the international community is going to make is to try to delay these elections as much as possible, to make sure that Abu Mazen is somehow propped up through these uh, reconstruction uh, mechanisms that they're planning on, on putting together. And, uh, and so the question of of Palestinian elections, the question of Palestinian representation, the pal question of Palestinian leadership is going to be an indefinite, I predict, a, a, an indefinite, um, indefinitely put off uh, because the international donor community likes it like this. If they didn't, they would have pressured Abu Mazen a long time ago to have elections. We haven't had elections in 15 years. Um, and so you can, it's, it's impossible for them to say they believe in democracy while at the same time propping up a leader who hasn't had a, uh, who hasn't allowed elections in 15 years. Thank you, Diana, and all of you. Um, yeah, again, we have a lot of questions and a lot of long questions. So um, bear with me here as I try to summarize some of them and um, see which ones have already been answered. We have a question from our executive director at Arab Center, Washington, D.C., Khalil Jahshan. He's asking um, if um, you think young Palestinian activists um, globally um, who are involved in this um, Sheikh Jarrah Intifada, as he calls it, are they aware of um, <coughs> the diagnosis associated with the Arab Spring a decade ago and the inability to translate um, the new energy and excitement into political gains? Um, is there a similar danger in Palestine today? Uh, we have a couple of questions um, somewhat related to that, but more about um, um, Arab solidarity and Arab youth. Um, do you think that this is a re-emergence of Arab solidarity um, with, um, with what we've seen, especially in light of the recent um, normalization deals between Israel and some Arab countries? Um, we, we had a couple of questions about those. We have some questions about your thoughts on um, the two-state solution. Um, if you still, um, you know, think about that or any really framework, um, is, is the one-state solution something that uh, the Palestinian youth are now uh, calling for? Um, that is um, one other question. Um, let me see if these have been answered. Bear with me here. Um, Hussein Tamimi, I think, uh, he advises a progressive member of Congress on foreign affairs. He's asking, how do you suggest progressive members continue to advance Palestinian advocacy and rights? Um, how can uh, they improve? Um, and so let me pick one last question here. Um, how has transnational solidarity across ethnic and geographical lines played a role in calling for a liberated Palestine? And I think um, that relates to another question about uh, this solidarity uh, from various social justice movements um, in the US and around, uh, around the world. How important are um, these movements? And we have 10 minutes, so um, we'll just... Um, go out uh, for one last round and give you all the chance to respond to any of these questions. Um, maybe we can start with uh, Amjad again. Yeah, uh, a lot to choose from. Um, I'll, I'll dive into the, to the two state, one state question. Um, if only because, and with all respect, um, I know that's a very common uh, dominant question. Uh, 
but I really hope that in the coming months, in the coming year, however long it takes, that that's almost no longer a question. Um, it is, um, it needs to be very evident from policymakers and the public discourse, et cetera, that any conversation that still thinks a two-state solution is somehow relevant, uh, it, it needs to be cast away. And the reason is not to like, it's just some intellectual exercise of whether it's two state versus one state, et cetera. Not a single Israeli is thinking about a two state solution in the way that, every, that the international community is thinking about the two state solution. Palestinians also cannot see the green line because it doesn't exist on the ground and it certainly doesn't exist in the pulse of the community. And you know, and, and the past few weeks, um, we, I mean, everything that happened in the past months should be the, like the most kind of perfect illustration of why the green line, you know, is only a line is only a dotted line on a Google Maps, nothing more. Uh, in, in addition to the lip, to the fact that Israelis, you know, can easily travel between the river and the sea, they cross settlements throughout the West Bank. Even I, as a Palestinian citizen, you know, with the with the few privileges I have with the blue ID card and the yellow license plate, that I can easily travel between here and throughout the West Bank on even settler roads if I wished, and to go see Maryam and Ramallah, for example, like. It, it, it's a very lived reality from the bottom, from the bottom all the way to the top. In addition to the fact that Israel controls everything from the West Bank to Hezbollah and so on, um, and and again, you know, the, the thing I was mentioning earlier about the idea of, of this uh, synchronized violence, you know, is your demonstration that Israel is the sole regime. There, we, there's, there is a one-state solution, and it's an apartheid solution. This is what is happening on the ground. Um, like I said, the fact that, the fact that the Israeli repress of mechanisms operating in Gaza, in West Bank, and inside 48, and, as well as at the borders, you know, are, there are Palestinian refugees uh, in exile also trying to like come, you know, come towards borders and I think Lebanon, even Jordan, like that you could see the single state apparatus operating throughout, throughout that line. And again, like we said, the fact that neither Israeli seat and the Palestinians themselves, we don't want to be fragmented and we are not fragmented by those geographic borders. And so the question is not, is a two-state solution still relevant? It's that it's irrelevant. The question is what kind of one-state solution, if that's the packaging that has to be formed, what is that solution that we're actually looking for? And it's either apartheid or not apartheid. Like what is, you know, what, right now there's a big conversation among Palestinians also questioning you know, the discourses that we've used about what does liberation mean? What does equality mean? And many was, was describing this exactly. Like, what does it mean to reimagine what a different kind of future is? And this also goes for Palestinian citizens, for example, where for the past, you know, I mean, for much of our struggle, we've also kind of had sort of mini fragmentation about thinking about trying to strive for equality as equal citizens. Uh, it never meant letting go of our Palestinian identity, but it meant trying to maximize our Israeli citizenship as much as possible, whether it was two states or one state. And, and, and that was essentially the, the form of the consensus. Uh, but even now that's being questioned, and especially even in the past um, few weeks, whereby we saw the extent to which it doesn't matter how much you sort of you know, economically integrate, uh, you know, into the Israeli system. It doesn't matter if you have Arab representatives in the Knesset. It doesn't matter that the joint list had 15 seats, third largest party last year. It doesn't matter, you know, that we are, you know, more educated, that we have more resources at our disposal, that we're doing everything that we thought would grant us equality. And all we're getting is pushback. All we're getting is repression. All we're getting is silencing. All we're being told is get back into your cages. Like the fact that Palestinian citizens, like you could end the, uh, Know, what's you know like the military occupation of West Bank and Gaza you could even create like a Palestinian state somehow which would is sh for sure to be a shriveled Bantustan uh, a Cajun's own right but what does that mean for example for Palestinian citizens in the state is the state that we're expected to be a part of still this uh, regime that prioritizes the supremacy of one ethnic group over another and in the end this is the system that operates from the river to the sea it may have different degrees but this is the struggle that we're up against and Palestinians can't accept it so that's the, that's the only conversation, and uh, and that needs to be understood by policymakers, by journalists, etc. And I think the day that I and again with respect to, the, to our audiences, I think the day that we aren't talking about the two-state solution is the day that we'll know that the conversation is caught up with what everyone believes on the ground. Uh, that's Israelis and Palestinians. That's how we understand the reality, you know, for better and for worse. Uh, and that's but also needs to be caught up um, by international by all internationals and allies abroad. Thank you, Amjad. And um, I think we can uh, uh, give Maryam a chance to answer some of, of the questions. Um, if you want to answer some of the other questions or, or the same questions, um, go ahead. 
Maryam. I'm going to touch on the question in regarding Arab uh, youth solidarity, especially in light of the normalization. Um, I recall when Bahrain was normalizing, um, I co-authored a piece with Maryam al Khawaja on how basically, again, um, just because the state is trying to normalize for its own political agenda does not mean that the, the people um, are normalizing, um, especially in the Arab world who have been rising up against dictators um, and oppressive regimes themselves. So you know, it's this is what Deanna said in terms of let's separate between the diplomatic um, uh, sphere and, and you know civil society. Uh, I, I do think we need all the solidarity we can get. Um, and I think we are getting it um, and it's slightly growing. They are being oppressed. So also speaking out on Palestine right now is a threat to these regimes. The second thing I just wanna to touch up on is in terms of the Congress um, advocacy and how to keep pushing that. Just go back um, to the US itself, the companies that are censoring Palestinians registered in the US, tell them, you know, we can't have that under US policy. Um, the criminalization of BDS, work on decriminalizing it at a county level, at a state level, um, and at the country level. And then finally, can we start um, speaking about the settler organizations based in the U.S. that are basically terrorist organizations running out from the U.S.? Um, maybe we can get Congress to at least push on that uh, instead of criminalizing Palestinians. But I do want to give the space to Deanna because I think she's going to touch up on good things right now. <laughs> Thank you, Mariam. I could hear you forever, actually. I was going to leave it to you. Um, I want to end by talking about solidarity as well. And I think one of the biggest problems, Tamara, with the uh, Oslo Accords, I mean, there were so many of them, but one of the biggest um, setbacks when it came to the Oslo Accords was that it, they really did away with solidarity, with transnational solidarity, because instead of it being a question of solidarity, the impression or the image was that somehow Palestinians can negotiate with Israel and that in negotiating with Israel, it's just the Israelis and the Palestinians sitting in the room together, completely taking out the power imbalance or ignoring the power, power imbalance that exists with them. And, uh, and so one of the things that's been so incredible is the, the revival of this solidarity because as Palestinians, there's always been, we've always, um, it's always been a two-way street. It's never just been this one-way street. There's always been two-way solidarity um, between prisoners in, in, in Palestine and prisoners in the United States and prisoners in Bahrain and, and, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and similarly with liberation movements. So one of the things that that has emerged from all of this as the Palestinian Authority is becoming or is irrelevant and given that the Palestinian Authority should dismantle itself, uh, even though it hasn't yet, is that you see this greater space that's been that's been given to actual solidarity where we see these movements coming to together and recognizing the linkages and recognizing the oppressors, the same oppressors that are providing weapons to Israel um, to shoot these, you know, those sponge bullets in uh, in Al Aqsa, and they're not sponge, by the way, or to shoot the 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 rubber bullets, which are not rubber, by the way, they're metal, co the rubber coated metal bullets, are the same companies that are using this equipment in the United States, and the same companies that are using the same equipment in Bahrain, and so on and so forth. And so to see that scope of of transnational solidarity revived once again. Is, is very heartening. And I, I can only see that the future is going to get brighter because of it. Thank you, Diana, for that. And uh, with this, we've reached the end of our time for today's discussion. Um, on behalf of Arab Center Washington DC, I would like to thank all of you, our speakers, for this um, excellent discussion and for your very insightful and um, important contributions. Um, I would also like to thank all of um, the audience who joined us today for tuning in. Um, the video of this discussion will be available on our website later. Um, thanks to all of you for um, being part of this program. Please stay in touch and follow our, our work at arabcenterdc.org. And we look forward to seeing you at our future events. Um, thank you everyone and take care. <laughs>